Well, hello to all you investors and wonderful to have you online. You should be seeing my screen here and uh, you can see that it's myself, Scott and Lyndon who are going to be joining you tonight. Uh, there's no formal presentation that we'd be going to going through tonight. What we are really trying to do is to find solutions. So when we embarked on this journey and we invited you all on a journey, it was to ultimately to become a global citizen and to build a global solution with global wallets. And I think it's really interesting from you know, my perspective in terms of all the questions that people have and the fact that they want to stay within a, within a global solution and a global wallet provider. And so it's without further ado that I wanted to hand over to Lyndon. You know, we've, um, Lyndon's done a tremendous amount of work in terms of where we're at speaking to all the key people. I know that it's been something that all the investors have asked us to do in terms of finding the answers. And, and to be honest, it's not a simple solution and there's not an easy, you know, this is the path for everybody that makes it particularly easy. But what I do think is important is for you to understand the amount of work and energy that has been put into this. And um, without further ado, I wanted to hand over to Lyndon. The purpose of tonight, and just so that everyone knows, is that what Lyndon's going to do is he's going to run through um, some of the findings that we've had. We're then going to run through an FAQ. You know, we get asked all the time about our structures and our wallets and the big picture and where we're going. Um, there's been some, um, some false uh, rumors that have been spread by certain uh, other companies which uh, need to be dealt with uh, directly, which we'll be running through tonight. And then the other thing that's really exciting is we've actually got Brendan Brown online. Um, a number of our wealth partners, and most of you will know Brendan if you invested in Med1, Med2, Med3, virtually all of you, um, you know, would have been part of the journey with Brendan. Brendan went on his own and has uh, done very successfully in a company called Infinity. And um, he's actually agreed a number of our wealth partners got hold of us and specifically wanted to participate in his deal. Um, it's a, he's raising, it's a massive deal. It's a 75 or $80 million deal. He can tell us the details. He's raising $23 million. He's already raised $21 million. And uh, because of the demand from the community, um, what we basically agreed for him to do was to allow people to participate uh, with their funds out of uh, Med2, Med3, et cetera. And um, so Brendan's going to be joining us uh, later, uh, probably around in, in the next uh, sort of 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how long the Q&A goes, uh, but definitely a hard stop on the hour where Brendan will join us. And we are going to be doing a pre-launch uh, discussion around Brendan's deal, uh, just so that you know, people have other options. You know, I always believe that diversification is critically important, not only across countries, currencies, assets, but also partners. You don't want all your money tied up in one partner. And um, it's really important that people have the diversification across partners as well. And so, Lyndon, just uh, before I hand over to you, anything else that is important in terms of the introduction before we get into the nitty gritty of trying to answer the question around, and, and by the way, Brendan and I are both online. We both invest in America. We both have LLCs. So we're fascinated, you know, just like everyone else. We're, we're constantly having to pay for our LLCs manage our bank accounts, pay the ongoing fees, et cetera. So I understand just ex exactly the same as everyone else uh, what is happening. And, you know, obviously we're always looking for safe and simple solutions that are that are better and even more sustainable going forward. Uh, sorry, Lyndon, anything from your side before we get into the nitty gritty? No, I think that's great, Scott. Let's rock and roll. Okay, so handing it over to you, the screen. Thank you. Let me just get it set up quickly here for everyone. Uh, all right. Please let me know, Scott, if you can just confirm that you're seeing. I'm just going to change the display setting, but you should now be able to see my uh, the slideshow. Yeah, we're seeing your. Yeah, there we're seeing your slideshow. Yeah. Okay. Are you also seeing all the um, various bits and pieces related to go to webinar? Or are you just seeing the slideshow? No, just the slideshow. All right, great. Well, as Scott says, good evening, everyone. Uh, it certainly has been an interesting two or three weeks, um, spending a lot of time engaging with a lot of different role players. Uh, I've spoken to many of you directly who have phoned me with questions or comments uh, or specific requests, and certainly I hope tonight we'll provide you the information you need. Up front, I also want to say that this is not my wheelhouse. Uh, I'm not a LLC specialist. I'm certainly not a USA investor specialist. I have had the benefit in the last two, three weeks, and I'm very grateful for the time that they provided. Uh, I spoke to uh, John in the US. I've spent quite a bit of time Herbert. speaking to Todd. So, 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 it's just important to explain it. So John Herbert, the lawyer, Todd Baldwin, the accountant. I mean, these are people okay. that we found 
uh, to be frank, Brendan and I actually found them when we started in 2012 and introduced them to all the investors. Yeah, correct. And also, I had, I had a great session with Lowe where from Orbest, who was also very useful and helpful in terms of helping us understand the options. So what we're really trying to do here is understand what are the options for the USA entities, the LLCs, and investing going forward. Um, up front, I must, I must say that my intention here is really to lay out options. Obviously, I have a wealth migrate perspective on this, um, and I'm going to try and keep that wealth migrate perspective until the very last slide. And until that point, I'm going to try and be as, as uh, neutral as possible because really I think our interests are aligned when we are serving our investors, and that's you. So I'm really hoping that the first bit will really create context, and then I will take a little punt on the Wealth Migrate solution at the end, um, but I'm certainly going to try and, and just have a very uh, broad spectrum before that. So in terms of uh, context, you know, five, five years ago, six years ago, many of you invested. Uh, with IPS and Wealth Migrate, we did not have a global structuring solution. And at that time, if you wanted to invest in the USA, the advice we were given, which we passed on, was you would need an LLC. And all the early investors into Med 1, 2, uh, 3, and 5, I think, used their LLC structures to do that investment. We are sitting in a situation now, which is why we're having these conversations, in that the at an investor level, so purely at the investor level from the investor's perspective, LLCs are not recommended for non-USA investments. So if you're wanting to invest in any opportunity, any deal that is not based in the USA, then your LLC is strongly, it's strongly recommended that you do not use your LLC. In particular, if, uh, if you're an American, absolutely it might be an option for you. But if you're not, if you live anywhere else in the world, you are just bringing in an additional tax complication as well as a regulatory complication that it is best to avoid. So from the investor perspective, <clears throat> your LLC is really a vehicle for USA investments. From a perspective of a platform like ours and like pretty much every other platform out there, when you have USA entities, it triggers a range of compliance issues. So platforms like ours and every other platform, uh, including, for example, I know Orbvest is currently creating two separate ones similar to the Wealth Migrate strategy, is that a platform has to serve either USA investors or non-USA investors. But having the same investors on a single platform uh, creates a range of compliance issues as well as tax issues um, that, that make it almost unfeasible, unfeasible for the platform and the structuring to operate with both those sets of um, investor bases. Uh, the complications, both legally and tax-wise, uh, are huge, and it actually creates restrictions for both the USA and the non-USA investors uh, that almost make that platform um, unfunctional. So the bottom here, line here in terms of why we're even having this conversation is that it is not recommended for you to be using your LLC for global investment solutions. And Wealth by Great cannot uh, allow LLC investors into our global solution. And I have got in brackets here yet, we are working on a USA uh, platform that will be specific for USA investors and USA entities, but it is, down, it is still coming down the line. It is, it is certainly not here yet. And our real target there is going to be USA citizens who do not have um, the options of, of investing in different entities from offshore. Um, the, I, I, in a way, I want to um, I understand that there are other complications with LLC, such as the costs of both the legal and the accounting side. And I think that that whether that's an issue or not will depend really on the size of your investments inside your LLC. So certainly we've had a lot of investors talking to me personally and I know to others about the cost associated with maintaining that structure. Um, and, I've, and I certainly understand that. Uh, and it is a part of obviously the decisions you're going to need to make going forward. So what does this mean? I just want to repeat it slightly differently. As an LLC, you can invest into USA deals directly, certainly but just not through the Wealth Migrate platform. Um, it also means that your money uh, will move through the LLC's bank account. So in other words, there's not yet, certainly not from our side, uh, there might be other platforms out there that you can invest through, but not that I know of, where that, the actual cash itself moves through bank accounts and you need bank accounts. 
If you're not if you're not a USA entity or investor, uh, you can invest through the Wealth Migrate platform uh, into a global portfolio, so into deals that are both inside the USA and outside of the USA, and also includes all best deals. And you can have a single global wallet. So this is obviously something we've responded to very much over the last uh, two to three years in terms of what the investors are requesting, which is wallets where when you have dividends that come into that wallet or money returned into that wallet, you can immediately from that wallet invest into any deal globally. And that's certainly our intention is to provide that uh, through the Wealth Migrate platform. It's at, the, it's at the very core of the business model in terms of the value we're trying to add to investors. So the real question um, we are being asked to provide insight or to provide thoughts on are for those with LLCs, what are the options now? And in a way, rephrasing that, because this is the question that people have asked us, is how can we close our LLCs now and move across to global investing if that is what you're wanting to do? And in making this decision, certainly um, in the conversations I've had with the people who are experts in this is there are a few things that need to be considered. Absolutely the tax implications of investing. Lyndon, we've lost you. <clears throat> just a quick one. Can you just let me know in the chat box if you've lost me or whether we've lost Lyndon? I think it's Lyndon because I'm still out. Yeah, okay. So I presume you can still hear me clearly. Yeah, okay. So we'll just wait for him uh, to come back online. Um, seems the connection's gone down. So if you've got any questions, what I'd suggest you do is if you just type them in the chat box, and then, as I said, we can run through once once he's been through all the details, then we can run through and um, go through all the questions. I'll see if there's any questions that come up now that I can answer in the meantime while we're waiting. So let's just see here. Okay, no, everyone's hearing me loud and clear. So if you've got any questions, let me know. Otherwise, we'll just wait for Lyndon to come back on. I'd like, I don't want to try and jump in and do... <laughs> To, uh, do his job because he's been doing a lot of research on this uh, in terms of the process. So just in my interest, um, while we're waiting for him, if you don't have any questions, what is the, uh, what would you like to get out of this evening? You know, obviously your time is valuable. Uh, what would you like to get out of, out of this evening? And the other thing that I just wanted to mention while we've got um, so many wealth partners online, we are actually looking to do a wealth partner uh, event on the weekend of the 8th of November to the 10th of November. So I just think I'll you know, mention it now while, while we've got so many people online. So it will be the 8th of November to the 10th of November. We are doing a roadshow. We've got quite a lot of exciting things that are coming up, um, including um, partners and, and everything else. I'll be letting everyone know about that and sharing it in the next couple of weeks. But I just want to, by the end of this week, we'll actually have the, um, the, uh, the date's out. What's happening now? <laughs> Lyndon, are you back there? We can see you going through your slides, but we can't hear you. Okay, so I'm back. Sorry, guys, I lost internet there for a second. Can I confirm you can hear me now? Yeah, we got you loud and clear. All right, apologies to everyone for that. My internet... always, worries me when, always worries me when my co-presenter disappears and it's on a topic that I haven't spent that much time researching. <laughs> <laughs> so much effort, I continue to be frank. All right, well, sorry about that for everyone. I apologize for that. My uh, All our power where I am currently went out, so I had to switch across to backup power. So I do apologize. Um, so just confirming, Scott, are you seeing the slide that says, how can we close our LLCs now and move back across? Correct, yeah. All right, great. So uh, I think where I was when the power went out was the considerations we need to take into account, which are the tax implications of investing through alternative structures. And then the second piece is, can you transfer your existing investments into a different structure? Um, so those are two things that we've spent quite a little bit of time exploring. 
And just to, just to make sure everyone understands that we're talking about the same thing, when we have a look at the tax considerations, what do we actually mean? So the top level is the implications, for example, of your, uh, your existing structure where you have an, a USA structure, your own LLC. That LLC does pay company tax and withholding tax when you, when you withdraw money. And then you can take that money straight into your own personal investor regime. And what that means is wherever, whichever entity you have as owning your LLC or being the beneficiary of your LLC, when the money is distributed from your LLC into your, uh, your personal entity, either in your own name or if you have any other offshore structures, uh, you may or may not have tax additionally at that level, depending on your local tax regime and whether there are agreements between that regime and the USA. So whether the tax you've already paid in the USA covers and takes into account that. When you move into the global regime, in other words, the one beneath, there is a USA structure, which is not your own personal one. It is, for example, a LLC that acts as a tax blocker. Uh, so for example, investors who are either investing, let's take the all best example, because I think many of you know it, if you're investing through the Seychelles, there will first be a tax blocker in the USA, then that tax blocker will pay company and withholding tax, it will distribute it to whatever that offshore SPV is in that particular scenario, for example, the Seychelles, and then the Seychelles will distribute that through to you as the investor. And obviously what uh, any structuring solution is trying to avoid is having that green block have additional taxes. So it's very important that that green block firstly has a relationship uh, with the US if it can to reduce that amount and that between the investor there are no additional tax pieces. So that's that's something that has to be taken into account when and if you choose at all to move from uh, the first scenario to the second. Scott, I want to I want to stop there just before I keep going on the options just to check if you've had anyone asking any questions for clarity on anything I've been speaking about so far. Um, so Denise has asked, will there be some sort of tax doc like an IRP5 to show earnings for tax purposes relevant to tax jurisdiction? Yeah, great question. So our, our new structures are going to be coming out of Australia. Um, and out of Australia, we will, they, it'll be, it's an investment company that is required firstly, obviously on its own side to manage all the SPVs and handle that. And we can talk a little bit about that Australian investment company if there are people who are interested. Um, and then that, that uh, investment company itself will be required as well as the platform to provide tax information to investors. Uh, once again, we don't necessarily, we just like the existing scenarios, we do not um, do any direct reporting to any uh, revenue regimes or tax regimes directly. Uh, we just provide information to the investors and they will then handle that themselves. Um, the one document that we're actually hoping for in the next day or two, uh, Denise, which we can also make sure, is that we get a overall picture of the tax regime in which our new structures are going to operate and where it might or might not have impact. Uh, so we will certainly be getting that in the next day or two to make sure that we can send out to people. Is that it, Scott, were there any others? There's a couple more. Um, I, I, you know, Lyndon, is it not better for you to finish and then go to questions? Because obviously the questions are going to start coming through. Uh, I mean, it's your choice, I can ask questions. Um, no, I'm happy to do that. If you can just keep your eye out, if there are any questions that, that where, where the question is really about clarity of something I've said, so that before I go into the options, there's, we're all sharing the same understanding. That's my real concern. If it's additional questions, then please do keep them until the end. Okay. Okay, so in terms of this, as an investor with an LLC, uh, you have our understanding of the scenario through these conversations is you've got three options. The one is you can certainly keep investing through your LLC. Once again, certainly recommend for USA investments only. Um, there are a range of options for you here. For example, you can go uh, into Orbest deals directly through your LLC, keep that process going. I know Orbest does have a USA uh, um, platform that you can engage with. There are a lot of other very good quality platforms in the USA that uh, do real estate investment, CrowdStreets, 
uh, or some of them, you can go directly with your LLCs into deals, for example, like Brendan's deals in the US. Obviously, you'd need to check what those different conditions are. So if you're wanting to keep within the USA and the USA only, um, option number one is certainly keep investing through your LLC. Option number two is where you make a choice that you want to switch into having a, glo a single global wallet and a global portfolio. And this is where over time, as your LLC finishes investments, you take the money and the resources out from those investments and wait until your final deal closes in your LLC and then close your LLC off. So for example, those who might have investments in uh, Medical 3 or Medical 5, uh, as Medical 2's uh, deal closes or medical one deal closes you take that money and you reinvest it in whatever way you want uh, outside of your LLC once you've withdrawn it out of the LLC and then the same happens with med three and med five and when all your investments are finished you then close down your LLC uh, obviously in building up a new global portfolio through a uh, different option. Option three is um, something we were initially very excited on and this is where you close your LLC now and for this to happen, you'd obviously need to remove the assets that are currently in your LLC. So in other words, if you have made three or made five uh, investments still sitting in your LLC, then we find a solution that would enable you to take those assets, put it into a different structure, and, and I can talk a little bit about what that might look like, and uh, then close your LLC all at once now. Um, so those are really the three options that through conversations we've explored. Uh, I think number one is fairly straightforward. Number two is fairly straightforward in terms of the processes. Number three is the one that uh, with every single person we've spoken to um, is the one that's made them sweat a little, raise their eyebrows and say, uh, if there's a lot of interest, it's possible, but it's not going to be easy. And there are certainly some big obstacles that we would need to overcome. Now, the key obstacle for option number three is that in transferring your shares, uh, so let's take medical five. Um, let me step back. Our initial thinking and conversations with these role players were is what happens, for example, if Wealth Migrate created a medical five LLC and that LLC took over each of your individual shares in medical five and then there was a separate offshore structure uh, that we would create a dedicated structure where you would all be shareholders that owned the new LLC Medical 5. So what we've effectively done through that scenario is created a LLC in the US that Wealth Migrate has to look after that acts as the tax blocker because that's what's required. It will then distribute the money to an offshore aggregation structure like I had that green block or for example, the role that a Seychelles structure currently performs, and then from there it would distribute uh, the returns and the gain back through to you. Uh, so very much setting up a similar structure to, for example, what the Seychelles structure operates or what our, our Australian structure operates on. In theory, that would be nice, uh, because then that would mean you could all close down your LLCs. The challenge we have on this one is actually fundamentally a tax challenge in that new regulations that have come out in the US require that if you are if you own shares in your LLC and you sell those shares even if it's at exactly the same uh, price as which you paid for them so even if there's no profit in theory the new regulations in the US still impose a withholding tax um, and that I think if if I remember my conversation with Todd correctly is at 15% what this means is that you have to withhold that tax within your LLC until such time as all the tax processes are finished and only then at that point you might you will get that money back uh, in particular if there was no profit but it would mean that there actually has to be physical cash withheld uh, at the point at the time that that transaction is enacted so in the scenario we've just described um, you know, as we are literally just transferring shares from one structure to another, we are not actually creating a cash transaction. So to get that 15% cash, we would actually have to, uh, you as the LLC owners would have to put in uh, a 15% of the deal transaction to sit there as a withholding tax. And obviously that's not ideal for anyone. Um, so once again, while it is possible to get investments out of your LLC, 
It has a huge amount of legal uh, work required. There's the withholding tax piece. Um, and in the long run, depending on the size of your actual investments in the LLC, uh, it, it, it might very well, if, if you've got a fairly small, small investment, if you've got a fairly small investment in your LLC, just those costs associated with doing that kind of transaction from a legal and taxing and tax advice perspective um, might cancel out the benefit of closing down your LLC in the short term. Um, so all of the people we spoke to strongly recommended um, if you wanted to have the global portfolio, then certainly go with option two. And if you just literally want to use your LLC to keep investing through the USA, then keep going through uh, option one. So that's really, I, I hope, a very neutral perspective on all of this. Um, I, I think it really depends now on your investment strategy in terms of what, what is your, your personal investment strategy. And I'm not an investment advisor, so I cannot uh, give you advice on that. Um, I, we've, we've tried to lay out the options as we see them, including highlighting what are some of the concerns or obstacles around that. Uh, in terms of option number two, um, there is no additional tax penalty for removing your funds outside of your LLC back into your personal entity um, that in theory you would have anyway. And what I mean by that is let's take Scott. Scott, if I can use you as an example, you are currently a Med2 investor. You have a personal LLC in the USA. That LLC with uh, Todd is going to sort out your tax um, scenario based on uh, the accumulated, accumulated losses over the last few years, if there have been uh, the capital gains, the depreciation, and it's going to come to a point that declares what your LLC has to pay in tax. And once that's done, you are able to take that cash out of your LLC and, and repatriate it back to yourself uh, without there being any additional consequences. So um, the taxes that you would have been liable, both in terms of within the LLC and in your personal name, however you have or may have not been declaring those, um, that doesn't change in terms of that scenario. So that's really it in terms of the three options. Um, and now, as I, as I did say, I'm certainly going to make a plug, uh, removing my, my hopefully neutral and independent space and really make a plug for option number two. And that's really because um, I have a firm belief that what uh, certainly what I joined up for in terms of the vision that I'm excited about in terms of the value we can add to global investors is around a global solution. It's about having a giving investors the opportunity to have diversification. And I'm going to go straight to the diversification because in my conversations with many of you over the last few days, that really has been the point that, um, that comes across the most. And the diversification here is really ac across three different levels. Um, and the first one, so I'm skipping to point bullet number point three if you, if you want to just follow it there. The first one is, is actually I'm going to start at the currency level. Uh, I think we're all aware of the fact that uh, diversification across currencies is not a bad idea. Um, if we can, if Wealth Migrate will be bringing deals in the next uh, six months from Europe, from the UK, from the USA, that's certainly where we're focusing on. Uh, Australia's property market is beginning to turn in its cycle, uh, but not quite yet where we are wanting to go into that space. So certainly having diversification across countries is, is, a, is a strategy that we're wanting to support. Um, within that, there's also diversification across asset class. So depending on what type of real estate, um, the asset classes themselves go through cycles in terms of whether you're in multifamily or medical or aged care or student. Um, all of those asset classes themselves have cycles. And as an investor, you probably want to be able to have diversification across the asset class. And then the third one is also really important, and that's as a diversification across sponsors. So these are the real estate investment companies that bring deals to our platform. And certainly, uh, we believe that uh, diversification into different sponsors uh, is a very good idea. Um, let's take, for example, a sponsor who you've been investing with and then changes their strategy and decide that they, for example, want to convert all their investments into a REIT. Uh, if, if you are only invested through that particular space, then you, all your investments are subject to that decision. Uh, you no longer have diversification or options to be in a different space. So that's certainly what Wealth Migrate is, is fundamentally um, achieving. 
is creating an opportunity for you to have a single a single portfolio that has a wallet in which dividends from one deal can immediately get put into a diversified range of new opportunities or withdrawn. Um, <coughs> and that's really without paying $20 and having to email people and PDF accounts and blah, 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 blah. Like it, it's actually fulfilling on the vision of what we've always wanted to achieve for the last six years. Yes, absolutely. We want a FinTech solution um, that has that has a world-class digital FinTech uh, wallet provider. Um, I want to talk a little bit, if I may, Scott, I literally want to take three or four minutes because I think uh, we certainly haven't been speaking about this to a lot of our investor base and for a very good reason, um, which I will explain. And that's really in terms of uh, in terms of diversification into different sponsors, what's our strategy and why have we actually been quite quiet about this of late? Um, we are very clear in terms of our target for the real estate investment companies that we want on board. And we want to have literally the blue chip. We want those who are the most respected and sought after real estate investment deals. Um, and in the USA in particular, which is where I think we're spending a lot of our time at the moment, we are very clear that if you have a look at the existing uh, platforms in the USA, I've, I've mentioned CrowdStreet before, they are the blue chip, probably globally, they are the blue chip crowdfunding platform in the world. Um, their due diligence team is 50 people strong. Uh, you, they, for every 100 uh, deals that get sent their way, they accept about two or three. Um, they have a record that is just phenomenal. And they are very selective in terms of they've only got about 25 to 30 sponsors who exist on their platform. Now, the good news is, is we know exactly who those 25 and 30 sponsors are. And having done our research and started, we are starting now engaging with those 25 to 30 sponsors. And we know that none of them have a solution that enables global investors to invest in their deals. Um, the reason we have, we have delayed the strategy until now is because we do not want to go to that quality of uh, sponsor until we have our wallets and our a structuring solution in place. And as Scott mentioned to you two weeks ago, we signed those contracts uh, two weeks ago. We're busy implementing it into our technology. So we are now at a point where we will aggressively be going out to the best sponsors um, in the USA uh, that have been gone through extensive due diligence processes. So we're, we've, we've had very few new sponsors over the last uh, nine months, quite deliberately. Uh, we've used uh, relationships that we know and trust, keeping all best, bringing, for example, Brendan in, um, but very, very clearly wanted to make sure that our platform uh, really only brings and deals with uh, the A-class sponsors um, and, and because of that reason, delaying doing that. We are about to find a very aggressive expansion into that space within the next three to four months. But I want to share with people very quickly, just visually, if you don't mind, I'm going to steal the screen back uh, just very yeah, visually because sure. uh, you've been talking about the wallet. So we've been given two contracts. Uh, one is with uh, this organization um, and basically based out of Europe. So fully uh, protected by European legislation and regulation and everything else. Um, you can basically see um, all the stuff that they do in terms of compliance, instantaneous KYC, simplified management, high performing APIs, secure payments, dedicated platform. Uh, all the different companies that that are using them and um, you can literally you can literally go through and read all about it um, in terms of the process so it's really quite exciting um, in terms of all the apis and everything else that uh, you know this, this is what we really get excited about if you look here is all the integrations and everything else that we can be offering um, you know one-stop regulated payments for our clients etc 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 so modular payment system you, you can basically see all the different stuff uh, which is really exciting to us and the other one which is out of hong kong is uh, banking as a service and uh, equally some massive clients between Google and Ripple and AWS, et cetera, seamless banking experience. Um, you can see all the compliance in the foreign exchange and the dashboards and everything else. And uh, wallet, you know, it's really interesting. BO and bank, wallet as a service, frictionless payments, uh, card issuance. This is really interesting. You can actually have a, um, a wealth migrate credit card um, in terms of it. So, and, and then you've got all the regulatory stuff as well. So I'll, I'm going to give you back the screen, uh, but we've actually been given the uh, contracts uh, for both of them. Um, and what we're going to do is 
probably from a tech perspective, we're not going to be able to bring out, you know, both at the exact same time. We'll probably have to do one and then the other. But, um, you know, the idea would certainly need to be to have an integrated solution for different parts of the world and, and ultimately provide people with the ability to, you know, even have multiple wallets, but all within one place. Uh, and again, I'm not talking in the next month, but, but certainly where we're going. Now, as Lyndon said, unfortunately, you know, um, Henny actually asked the question on the webinar, of, I don't know, was it two weeks ago we did the webinar? And he said, you know, why, why, isn't, why don't we have it already? It's a very simple solution. We built all the tech, it was fully integrated and ready to go back in November last year. And the connection with the Seychelles, um, actually, uh, we, we got uh, bounced from a, um, a compliance perspective uh, by that operator. Now that we've uh, we actually got very good news yesterday around our regulatory piece and um, with the licenses and everything else. And um, now that we've got that all sorted and, and again with no connection to the Seychelles, uh, we, we're now actually going you know full steam ahead in terms of integrating that. So as Lyndon said, there's the there's the component on this supply side which is critically important as it opens up the world. But what's more important and, and quite frankly for me selfishly, but for all of you as customers um, and investors selfishly. You know, this just takes the customer experience to a whole new level of, of what is possible. And you know, the good news is, um, Lyndon and the team of you know Paul and and etc. have made measurable progress in, in in turning that vision into a reality. Sorry for butting in, Lyndon, but I love to be able to show people visually where they're going. Sure, no worries. And um, it's backed by, and it's backed by some of the biggest banks in the world. You know, literally, like you know, it's 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 <laughs> this is these are global regulated solutions out of Europe and Hong Kong. You know, not not. Um, you know, not little small ad hoc solutions, you know. Yeah, so I, one of the, so I'd like to thank, uh, I think it was, um, I think it was Hildage, but I might be wrong, great conversations today, who asked me, um, you know, guys, we, the, the, there, is, there is a problem in transferring money from what our previous wallet system to the new one, and we acknowledge that, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a pain. And the request was, please make sure this is the last time we ever have to do this. And the fundamental, the fundamental answer to that is, uh, we agree with you 100%. And the reason we need that, or, or what we need to enable that, is the wallet solution itself cannot be linked to any particular structure solution um, or to any particular uh, compliance solution. So the wallet itself has to be independent so that if we in two years time figure out that the uk has passed much more progressive crowdfunding uh, licensing than our current financial license out of australia we can we can shift our licensing arrangement and for example if we start uh, creating our spvs out of ireland um, then we can do that but we can do that while maintaining a completely independent uh, wallet structure so it's been it's it's a it's a massive undertaking to put in place all the different pieces to put this puzzle together, but we wanted to make sure that we had exactly the right puzzle so that we're not trying to redo this uh, again ever. Uh, that's yeah, again, I'm, I'm I'm pretty much the same as most people here, where you know I've got properties in different countries, I've got my LLCs, I've got some some investments in my LLCs, I've got some you know now in the Seychelles. Um, it's everything that I didn't want. I, I always wanted it all to be in one place. And you know what we what we're trying to do now, and what Linda's basically saying to you, is that it's completely an agnostic, um, and it's it's a built for service. I mean, you saw it, you know, banking as a service, etc. And um, and th and that you know that's beautiful because it's not tied to one structure, um, you know, or, or one sponsor or, or anything like that. You know, it it truly can be the global solution, which is what you know we always stick to the vision. You know. Yep. The last thing I want to talk about very quickly is the legacy investors pay no fees. Um, was, because when Wealth Migrate shifted its business model a year ago, uh, we were no longer the person in control of the deal. So we cannot add um, that extra 6-7% into the actual investment piece that then covers the Wealth Migrate fees. So what we've done is we split our fees between investors and the suppliers. So sure, we get a, a commission on the supply side, normally between two to three percent, and then we the investors themselves pay between two to three percent uh, over and above their investment amount. So what this means, just to make it very real, is that if I'm in about to invest in a deal as a as a normal investor, um, I want to put in ten thousand dollars. The platform will say thank you for your ten thousand dollar investment. Your fees will be 3%, so please deposit 
uh, 10,300, sorry, I have to do the math every time, please deposit $10,300 um, into your into the, the wallet system. Um, what we have done is, and we made this decision and communicated it, I think, to most of you about six, seven months ago, is our legacy investors will never face the investor-facing fees, not on the initial payment, not on the dividends, and not on the exit. And those are fees that all other wealth migrate investors from this point forward will be facing. Uh, we do have a slight, uh, a better class of, of fees for our extremely high net worth investors. In other words, those who invest a million or more. Um, however, even for them, their fee is set at 1%. So uh, it's only legacy investors who get to pay no fees. So that's the last final piece just in terms of that. Two things that are important there. One is that if you're a wealth partner and you've watched any of the presentations over the last couple of years, you'll remember that the focus for Wealth Migrate, and I'm now talking for the shareholders, is ultimately to get to a million transactions in a calendar year at an average of $2,000 per transaction at an average of 5%. Uh, and that's monetizing the buy and the demand, you know, the, dem the supply and the demand side, um, which, which is really important to explain what Lyndon's just said. Uh, the second thing that's really important is that we basically copied the um, Airbnb model, which is what we realized was that when you were dealing with people, and I've had both my brother as an anethyst, I've had a very good friend that's very intelligent as an entrepreneur. And when you start carrying a, talking about carries and waterfalls and hurdle rates, their eyes just close over and they disappear. Whereas when you go, you know, you know, what is the fee? And you go, it's no more than 3%. They completely get it. It's understandable. It's transparent. It's above board, and it allows you to scale. <clears throat> so, you know, we've been through that in quite a lot of detail. Um, in fact, I presented it to the board uh, over two and a half years ago. Um, to, you know, because without making it easy, you cannot scale to a global solution. And and then all that we did for the legacy investors, so everyone that's invested, um, you know, before the uh, version five went live was we removed those fees so that it was completely exactly the same for them and nothing would change. And, and by the way, whether you invest in an Orbest deal directly with Orbest or whether you invest in an Orbest deal through our platform, you will get exactly the same return to the cent. Scott, that's really it in terms of the presentation. I think in terms of our options, I've left this slide on for everyone to see. Um, in terms of option three, maybe my final comment is it was strongly recommended we do not do this. However, um, uh, it is an option if, if there is a very strong consensus from a sufficiently large enough group of people that they'd like to uh, get far more information and, um, and explore this a little bit more. Understanding that, uh, that withholding tax piece, um, we can certainly explore it on behalf of our investors. Uh, we will certainly uh, do whatever we can. Um, you know, I think that's part of tonight is to make sure everyone has the information and then really just open up to, to hear from investors what it is uh, that you want in terms of your route forward and then see how we can help make that possible. But then there are lots of questions, so I'm just going to go top to bottom. So Sean Stewart asked, what happens to our fixed assets in the US for those that bought houses? Yes, Sean, great question. Um, we have explored in the past, I know about two years ago, we explored an option for helping people who wanted to move out of their houses into a different structure. Um, it, is a, the, it, it is something still on the table. Once again, if there's a sufficient amount, amount of people, we can create almost a, uh, a, a residential um, uh, portfolio that we amalgamate everyone's different houses into a single portfolio. That's really the only option we would have. It would still it would still be under the same um, considerations as point number three, which is uh, my understanding is uh, if you are selling that house into a different portfolio structure, another LLC, a collective LLC, uh, there would still be a withholding tax that would need to be uh, paid, even though you may get it back six or eight months later or whenever the tax piece is finished, uh, but it would still be an upfront tax that would need to be paid. Uh, so that would just be um, our proposal around that. Once again, if there are sufficient amount of people who are all saying, yep, I'd like my, I'd like to keep my investment, um, even if it is in a collective rather than as an individual house, uh, we can certainly explore a, a plan for that and, and come back to everyone if they're interested. 
uh, Mandy's asking, uh, with currently being in an LLC, can we invest directly in Brendan through John Herbert, but indirectly through the Wealth Migrate platform? So effectively, um, yeah, investing in the LLC into um, you know, Brendan's deal, but wanting all the metrics and everything to still go through the Wealth Migrate platform. So there, there are two answers to that question. The first one uh, is, sorry, it was Amandi, I think I Scott, is that correct? Yeah, yeah so Mandy, thanks. The, the first part to that question is, um, you can invest directly from your LLC into Brendan's, uh, into Infinity's deal, absolutely, and into any other deal. Uh, you know, let's put it out there. Um, the, the problem here is it would not be able to operate through the Wealth Migrate ecosystem. And uh, so in other words, not be able to operate through the wallet system so that the funds are returned through the Wealth Migrate wallets and then enable you to have that global portfolio option. Um, this come back to that regulatory piece around the fact that we as Wealth Migrate cannot have a platform at this stage. And once again, I want to emphasize at this point where the, uh, the USA investors are sharing an ecosystem with non-USA investors. Uh, we are looking at having a scenario, um, and it's probably about six months away, uh, to be honest, where we will have a platform for USA investors, in which case they will be able to invest um, in our global deals and potentially USA deals. Um, and the underlying structure there would be shared. So example, your wallet system uh, would be shared. Uh, However, at this point, we are not able to do that. Uh, we have not yet, at a technology level and a process level, separated out. Being able, we, will, we are not yet able to completely have a, a Chinese wall between the USA and non-USA investors. So to answer your question, if you certainly if you want to invest straight into the Infinity deal, uh, absolutely. I think that would be you know the same philosophy that you're wanting to invest into the Orbis deal. However, it would not be able to reflect uh, in the Wealth Migrate ecosystem at this point. So it would, I mean, Brendan, it will be reflecting. Uh, sorry, not Brendan. Uh, Linda, it will be reflecting. We will be able to uh, reflect that the only thing that we won't be able to do is show the dividends through the global wallet. Like it will be going. Brendan will be paying it back into the LLC of the bank account, basically. Uh, no, Scott, at this point, it would not reflect at all. It would be a direct relationship between Brendan's Infinity deal and the investor. It would not, yeah, it would not, reflect, it would not reflect as a transaction on the Wealth Migrate platform. Yeah, so, I mean, we can take that offline. We, we, we need to find a way, and we will find a way through strategic partnerships to be able to reflect it. Um, in terms of what we're doing, so um, yeah, I mean it is it is critically important for the existing investors with existing LLCs. Um, so I, I understand exactly what Lyndon's saying, and you know for for the likes of Mandy and others that are wanting to invest directly in Brendan's deal, you know definitely go ahead. I know Brendan's coming online, and we've actually discussed this um, in terms of you know making it easy for them um, in terms of that process. So. Um, Denise said, uh, does your SPV have any costs or tax challenges? Yeah, great question if I understand it correctly. The, um, the cost challenge here is actually easier for us than our previous structuring solution through the Seychelles. Uh, it's cheaper. So it does mean that we have um, a cheaper creation of an SPV solution so that our minimums can be lower than they were previously. So in our previous Wealth Migrate history, we would need a minimum of about $500,000 as an equity raise before we could create a ring-fenced SPV for any particular deal. Uh, at the moment, our minimums sit at about, uh, about uh, $200,000 in terms of, of covering the costs. And we have made a collective choice at Wealth Migrate just for the next five to six months while we are finishing the implementation of the wallets, et cetera, that as long as we have $100,000 into a particular deal, we will go ahead and create that uh, SPV, even if it is at a slight loss in terms of uh, wealth migrate ourselves. In terms of the tax implication, um, is the Australian government released a the, the particular structure and the the AMIT structure we're going under that our structuring is, is structured through. They are trying to compete with the likes of places like Ireland who give you a complete tax neutrality no matter where you are in the world. So um, they are they have a whole bunch of regulations that are coming out. Most of them are already in place, which is driving the tax implications of our Australian structure uh, almost to zero and everything 
uh, gets treated in our structures as capital gains and then those capital gains exemptions uh, are pretty pretty close to zero. Uh, at most, at the moment, we are looking at a potential 5% tax um, on a capital gain. However, uh, because depending on where the deal comes from, so if it's a USA deal, for example, there are existing tax treaties between Australia and the USA, which could mitigate that and, and bring that tax down to zero. In terms of once we pay out from the Australian structure to each individual when they actually want to declare it, however they declare it in their, in their own tax regime, uh, that wouldn't change. It's pretty much uh, that individual and that tax regime, you would need to do the research in terms of your tax treaties uh, with the Australian system. Okay, um, Okay. if I sold MED 3, 7, 9 and 12, can I close the LLC now? Will all this allow this? That's a great question. I think we'd have to ask them. Um, you know, I know in the past they have certainly enabled trades, offline trades in deals. Uh, so, you know, I think they have got a precedent where they have allowed people to sell out of deals. Uh, but that is, I certainly can't speak on behalf of all best on that one. I mean, I've done it and I can't see why, that, you know, it's willing buyer, willing seller. Yeah? Um, okay, how safe will this SPV be in terms of holding our funds? Is the money safe and guaranteed? How will this be assessed? Yeah, oh, great. So I'll tell you one thing about the Australian regime that's probably the most uh, highly regulated and risk averse regime anywhere in the world right now, uh, even more so <laughs> than, for example, the USA. So I can guarantee you that the, uh, the regulatory <laughs> environment it, it is one of the reasons why we actually looked at it, because if you go to one of the toughest regimes in the world, it allows you to passport around the world, because the way it works in, around the world from a regulatory perspective is if you, as an example, get South African regulation, it doesn't automatically mean you'll get it in England, Australia, America, you know, et cetera. But if you have a regulatory um, a license, which is deemed as higher than the country you're in, then you can automatically passport to that country. So the higher you go, the more difficult it is, but the more global that you can provide a solution after that. Yeah, correct. So uh, the principles of our structuring are very, very much the same as they've always been. Uh, each individual SPV is completely ring fenced from any other uh, deal. There is no um, shared liability across them. Uh, in terms of the actual financial flows, uh, the principle that we've always maintained is that wealth migrate does not touch your money and at no time will ever hold your money. Uh, our wallet provider, one of the reasons they are the global leaders in the world is because they have a completely um, ring-fenced system of managing wallets that you can still do it from within our platform. So in other words, you once you've logged into our platform, uh, you are actually through our platform speaking to their banking solution directly and we as Wealth Migrate can never uh, do a transaction from your wallet on your behalf. Uh, not are, we even mention, are we allowed to mention the bank, Vernon? Um, I, I don't see why, why not. It's on their website. So one of their banks that they operate through is Barclays in terms of the back of Lemonway. Uh, but that's just one of their bank partners. They certainly have different banking partners around the world. Um, but, you know, just the, the point I want to make is that uh, even manually, even if you asked me, Lyndon, please go and do a withdrawal out of our wallet, uh, we cannot do that. Uh, it has to be via the wallet service provider's login. Uh, so in terms of our previous system, there was a huge amount of manual work involved. You know, you would send through a withdrawal form um, and then they would manually go and say, okay, where's this going? Uh, our new wallet provider is under such strong EU regulations. So let me just explain that. Our wallet provider, Lemonway, they have uh, a whole range of different regulatory environments they've got to conform to including payments, but also holding clients' money. In other words, physically, uh, the ability to keep money in an account on your behalf. Um, and the EU regulations were probably the most strict regulations around this particular piece uh, globally. And once again, that's why we went for a European Union warrant provider. So in terms of all of those pieces, um, the core principle of Wealth Migrate is that we do, firstly, every SPV is ring-fenced and we do not have any control or access to the money in wallets at all. 
Okay, um, I'm conscious of time because we did say we're going to have a hard stop at eight uh, for Brennan because he's obviously waiting to come online. And if there's more questions, we can keep going later. But um, so I'm going to try to run through these as quick as I can. Uh, Danae said, love the idea about legacy investors not paying fees, but this is not realistic. Wild Migrate needs to make money. So we have explained that, Danae, um, we are making money on the supply side as we would, and it doesn't cost the investors uh, any further money uh, in terms of that process. Um, so it's, but it's, but it's equally allowing our legacy investors the same experience. Um, what are the timelines to have this wallet in place? Um, so basically, you know, now, now it's a case of uh, contracts have been sent back and forth. And so now it's really, you know, we, we're working from an integration perspective. And I think Lyndon, we're looking at sort of six to eight weeks, um, in terms of, uh, actually getting it all live and everything else. It is. It's a little bit of how long is your piece of string, but but that's what they sort of recommend in terms of the timelines, as I understand. Yeah, correct. So Lemonway themselves say that they are they they say three weeks. Uh, our tech team's level of um, detail and uh, ensuring that we have a scalable solution that can handle uh, the the paradigm we set ourselves is trial ten thousand transactions per second. So our tech team is extremely pedantic, extreme, extremely security conscious. So we've added an extra two to three weeks onto that timeline just to make sure that um, we are we are implementing the solution to our standards. Uh, if any of you have ever met Gavin, our CTO, um, you will know that he is so pedantic that often it's very frustrating even having a conversation with him because he literally will take each word that you say at its at its um at its face value, he won't read into it anything. He's, he's that pedantic. Uh, and he is certainly keeping a very tight control over any implementation to exist into external systems. That being said, what we're doing in the meantime is we are using uh, John Herbert as an escrow uh, solution to get new deals going. So when they, for example, the deals we've got, people are depositing money into escrows and, uh, in, that John is holding for us. And by the time those those deals start producing dividends, our wallet system will be in place and the dividends and all payments will go back into the wallet system. Yeah, and again, obviously we're not touching the cash and it's completely protected. And as John's a US attorney, it's protected by the legal society as if anyone was buying a house in America <clears throat> or any property for that matter. Um, and all your money for the last five years has gone through John anyway. <laughs> Nothing's changed. Um, Andrew, Global Wallet sounds great. Let's get the cost and implications involved to establish feasibility. Uh, Andrew, I don't know if we've been through that or if there's more that we can help with. Please, the one thing I will say here is that you've all got my details. You know, Lyndon's obviously the one that's been project managing this. If you want to deal directly with Lyndon, you know, please let, um, you know, please, please reach out if there's anything that we haven't answered. Um, so I'm not sure, Andrew, if we've answered your question there. Um, Hilda said, can the LLCs not be sold to an individual? Must it be to another LLC? So can I sell my LLC shares to myself? I think that's what you were trying to answer, is it not, Lyndon? Yeah, so Hilda, it's a great question. Again, you can sell them to yourself. At that point, there would still be a 15% uh, tax, withholding tax that you would need to put into the LLC until such time as the LLC's affairs have been wrapped up and closed. Um, so it is an option if you have that cash that you would be able to put into that as part of that withholding. When I spoke to Todd around this, he did say, you know, that money does come back um, because it's literally a withholding tax until such time as the uh, complete affairs of the LLC are done. Um, but that would be an implication any time, according to these new regulations, any time there is a uh, a sell of a share out of an LLC structure, this new rule requires that there is some kind of uh, backstop or, or um, withholding just so that the uh, the US government can make sure that they, if there are tax liabilities down the line, there is money available to cover it. Brian has said, and then I think if Brendan, if you're, if you're live, let's do Brian, let's do Brian, that's actually just a comment and then we'll go straight to Brendan live. Um, Brian has said, I believe this option is going to make my decision easier to sell Medical 3. I only have Medical 3 left in my LLC. All my other investments, Med 12, Cypress, et cetera, are already in my name using the Wild Migrate Wallet. The legal and accounting fees will be worse than any growth I have just in one medical. Yeah, so I think I think that's, I mean, Brian, from my perspective, I've got the same thing. I'm going to, if, if, I, if, if we can't find a solution to have a wholesale sell, sell through, then, I'll, then I will sell off and I'll just make sure that I invest um you know all my future investments um through the right structure 
to enable me to use the global platform. Because again, I want to be able to access my money. I, I love the fact that, you know, you know, even having things like credit cards and whatever, you know, that, that's how it should be, you know, online banking. That's all what we all used to. Um, and it's really, really where we want to go. So I'm hoping Brendan is here. How's it, guys? I am here. Okay. So uh, with a bit of excitement, uh, Brendan, I want to welcome you onto the platform. And while I've got you uh, coming live here, I'd like you just to talk a little bit. I don't know if you've got um, any slides that you want to share um, or if you, I've got some stuff I want to share basically, but yeah, I'd, what I'd like to do quickly is be, before you get going, I just wanted to let everyone know that they, whoever's live now is the first people to know that Brendan's deal is now live on the Wild Migrate platform. It went live like 10 minutes ago. And um, so we are truly in pre-launch phase and truly the people that you know have walked this journey the longest quite frankly with brendan and i and i mean if people do or don't remember we came a long time uh, before anyone else actually because <laughs> brendan and i went to america back in uh well I, you know him and i had been going independently 2010 2011 but actually we went together in 2012 and it was really him and i that brought you america um you know we were the ones that invited you know henny and yaku and 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 years later Michiel and you know etc and so it's really quite exciting brendan that you know what you've been doing there with Infinity, and for me it's extremely exciting, and I'm very grateful to you know have you on tonight. But but more importantly for all the investors who know you well to have your deal live on the platform. So I uh, I just thought I would mention that. I don't know if you've even seen, but you've gone you're all live on the platform. I, I got a WhatsApp message uh, that said it was live, and and I was like uh, smiling from ear to ear when I got it. I just want to say like well well two things. Thanks for having me on, and also just like congratulations, guys. Like um, I got to catch a few minutes here of what you've been chatting about, and I, and I must say, like what you've been building is phenomenal. So I'm I'm really impressed. And um, to get to a point where you now can implement a global system where people are online in multiple assets with diversified uh, across currencies, assets, uh, sponsors, geographies with with small amounts of money, like you've you've pulled it off, and well done. Well, as you said to me, Brendan, many years ago, it's going to be a lot harder than you think, Scott, but uh, <laughs> you, you were right there. But uh, credit to Lyndon and, and Paul and, you know, all the Gavin and all the other team members, you know, we, we, we're getting there. You know, there's so many. I, I really think, we, you know, we need to acknowledge all the team members. I know Cisco's online and everything. So, you know, there's been a huge amount of teamwork. I know Mersh is up late trying to get your deal live and, and it's live. So I don't want to mention names because it's been a team effort. You know? No, it's phenomenal, man. And, and thank you very much for inviting us to be a part of it um we you know i'm, I'm excited to be able to finally have a, a deal on that's got some uh, some momentum uh so, so let me just run through it quickly I'll, I'll give you i know everybody's under pressure on time um and it's late there in south africa already so i'll give it a a, a quick overview and then if anybody's got any questions we can drill into it but um let me tell you the story of how we were able to access this deal and a little bit about the deal itself so uh one of the uh, our investor partners that's been working with us for a while over here in South Africa. Um, his name's Greg. They own a company called Spartan Truck Hire. I'm sure most people have heard of it in South Africa. It's probably the biggest, if not uh, one of the biggest logistics companies in South Africa. Um, Greg's been investing independently, him and his dad, uh, their own money in the US since around when we started, uh, strangely enough, Scott. So, so they did it on their own and they went in with uh, Greg's cousin, Alon. Now, Alon is an ex-South African. He moved to the U.S. when he was about 12 years old. Um, so he's pretty much an American now, um, but still has a, a strong link back to South Africa. Um, and Greg and his dad have been investing with Alon in around $250 million worth of transactions in the We just lost uh, Brendan. Sorry? We lost uh, Brendan. Last you there for like 10 seconds if you just repeat that. Okay, so I was just saying that um, uh, Greg uh, has been investing with his dad in Alon's deals. Alon is the sponsor that brought us this deal. He's an ex-South African um, and he's got a platform of around $250 million of assets under management. Uh, they have very, very wealthy families out of Israel and South Africa that have uh, and the US that have backed them. Um, and the only reason we got access to Alon is simply because Greg knows us and he says, look, uh, 
he wants to work with us on some deals and work with us in South Africa. Um, and Alon was pretty much allowing Greg and his dad to ride along with him in deals uh, that he was doing anyway. Um, and then we came to the table and said, okay, let's do something together. And then the first deal that came along, uh, we lost. We got pipped at the post. As you know, what happens in the US is you end up in a best and final bidding scenario. You've got to show the proof of funds. You've got to show your ability to close. You've got to show all of these things, which luckily we had. We just exited some deals. So we had, uh, you know, probably 15 odd million dollars in the bank at the time. So we could show proof of funds. And we still lost two deals back to back um, because of other people that were willing to go hard on deposits. And when I say hard, they're willing to do a non-refundable deposit of $1 million without a due diligence period. And we just can't match that level of, of commitment to a deal because I like to verify what the seller is saying before we stand a chance of losing money. Um, so we'd never go hard on a, on a deposit up front. And people were being very aggressive in the market. So we lost a couple of deals. And then eventually this one came along and we were actually just trying to buy one of the assets because, you know, um, we, we've never raised on a $75 million deal to go and raise 22 or $23 million in equity is a hell of a lot of, of money, especially if 90% uh, of it's coming out of South Africa. Um, so $20 million in perspective is 300 million Rand. So to get people to move on time, that quantum of money was quite a big task. Um, and when the, the seller came back to us and said, look, the amount of work that we're going to go through to try and sell all five of these assets and you only want to buy the one, uh, like we, we don't want to do that. We want to sell the portfolio. So we got together with the investment committee, which is myself and Kevin and, and Jared and Greg, and we had a good chat and we said, okay, are we going to take this on or not? Um, luckily, we had a bit of a head start because we'd exited some deals. So we had some money in the bank uh, from investors that were willing to roll into another deal. Um, and we said, yes, let's go for it. So we signed the, the purchase and sale contract. We we flew out to Oklahoma. We walked every single property. And I got more excited than I've been in a very long time because the amount of um, of deals that we look at, just to give you uh, some, some uh, insights, is very similar to what CrowdStreet does. Like we'll look at 200 deals and try and buy five and maybe win one if we're lucky. Um, so when we got the opportunity to buy this at a 6.3% cap rate, which uh, if, if anybody's uh, active in the US at the moment in the multifamily space, you'll know that most deals are trading, if it's B-class product like this is, uh, which is very good quality product in good neighborhoods with good quality tenants, it's not low income housing or anything like that, um, uh, is most of that stuff is trading at a, at a five to a five and a half percent cap rate. Uh, which means we've got a very significant discount going into the deal. And the reason we were able to get the discount was uh, there were three primary reasons. One, the brokers worked with Elon before and has sold properties to him and bought properties uh, or at least um, sold properties for him. The second one is we'd lost the other two deals through the same broker and he was very much embarrassed because the one deal we'd actually been verbally uh, awarded the deal and the next day we got told no somebody else put down a million dollars hard and you're out so the broker wanted to make it up to us and the last one was we said look we'll buy all five properties in one go you don't need to go through the headache as you can imagine if you're a seller in the market as hot as it is now you're gonna have lots of different offers lots of buyers lots of tours and the guy just wants to get on with his job now he wants to move on and go and deploy their capital into more a-class product the reason they're doing that is they listed. So they listed their company last year um, and they're moving out of B-class product and into A-class product, which means they're going to have lower yields, but they've got a much more sort of presentable balance sheet uh, as a listed entity. So we said, look, we'll buy the whole portfolio. We'll say yes, but then we want a reasonable price and we'll make it painless and we will uh, do our due diligence thoroughly without messing you around. And they said, okay, that sounds fantastic. Let's sign and let's go. So we signed, uh, we paid our deposits, and we're now, uh, our due diligence period actually expired yesterday. Um, well, today, actually, it was. Uh, so we are we now in a situation where our deposit is hard, it's non-refundable. We've had our 45 days free look, um, and we're very, very comfortable with it. I want to give you some insight into the level of due diligence that we do. We walk every property, we get third-party appraisals, we get environmental reports, we get... Uh, title reports, uh, we get in, uh, engineering reports, land surveys, 
I do a thorough analysis of three years of the financials. Luckily, when you're working with a listed company that's that's selling, uh, they, they generally don't lie because they don't like you know going to jail or losing um, shareholder uh, value. So they are very, very, very forthcoming with information. Um, and the more information I got, the more excited I got about this deal because the income was not only real, it was getting better. So as we were doing our due diligence, they were um, renewing leases, you know, like they're normally operating a property. And typically when a seller is in a period where they, have in their mind, sold a deal, they stop really paying attention. In this case, they didn't stop paying attention. They're very, very, very sophisticated. Um, their staff are amazing and we'll be taking over their staff as well. And, and it's extremely exciting to see that the numbers actually got better as we were going through the due diligence process instead of getting worse. Um, to give you a breakdown of, of what are the numbers. So we're purchasing this property all in with uh, closing costs and, and uh, legal fees and due diligence fees and all of our flights out there and everything for approximately $75 million. The deposit that we require is about $23 million. And the, the debt that we're getting is from Morgan Stanley. Um, at 52 to 53 million dollars they're giving us a bit of a, a slush fund for capital projects um, and the reason they're giving us that slush fund is we believe and they believe that we can roll out a small value add play as a test so what do i mean by value add play is we'll take that slush fund which we're borrowing from them at roughly 3.7 percent um which is phenomenal but we're going to take that and go and test out a, a value add package on some of these properties so we'll go and do a renovation. Let's say we'll spend three thousand dollars on one unit, five thousand on another, and eight thousand on another, and then we'll test uh, what kind of rental upticks we can get on those particular uh, units. And if it validates the the capital expenditure, we'll then roll out a full value add program to boost the returns. This doesn't mean that um, we have to roll out a value add program. This property produces at minimum right at, as it stands today without doing anything out the gates, we'll be able to distribute 8% cash on cash to the investors every year and we pay out quarterly. So um, so even if we do nothing, we're going to have 8% distributions. And then in terms of, of what's our potential upside over here, and I just wanna say why I'm personally investing in this project and I'm investing a lot. Infinity's putting in about $1.1 $1 .1 million. So, so we put our money where our mouth is. It's really a case of co-investing alongside everybody. And we couldn't buy this level of deal unless we had people coming in with us. And most of the time, the people coming in with us can't buy this level of deal on their own. So it's very much a symbiotic relationship that we have with our partners and our investors. And we look for assets very similar to, to the way banks underwrite assets. We want to make sure the income is real. Now, the upside I'm talking about here is we have to ask ourselves, what is the probability if after five years that we've been in this project, is, is it probable that we could increase rents every year by at least $30 a month? Now, we've got 827 units here across five different assets. So what I love about that is you diversified from day one, and I'd rather have 827 tenants paying me than five or six or seven. I mean, I know a lot of people have, have invested in some commercial assets and stuff, and when one commercial tenant leaves and it's 20 or 25 percent of the cash flow all of a sudden you don't have any cash flow um, so i like diversification i like multifamily because of its inherent diversification and then we if we ask ourselves a simple question of of increases is if we're increasing the rent at at least 30 dollars a year there's two things that happen one nobody leaves for 30 dollars why because it's too expensive for the tenant to go and find another unit pay his deposit pay a truck rental take the time out to pack all of his stuff, move down the road, hire the labor to do it, because in the US, labor is expensive, um, and actually move. So for $30, generally people don't move. What also tends to happen is in a, in a market that is under pressure in terms of what's available, like ours are, which is why we're running at a 96% occupancy at the moment, is they generally don't have another place to go to that isn't more expensive than we already have. So they just tend to stay. So if we say, well, we increase it. It's, it's like the, the frog in the boiling water. We just do a little bit, little bit, little bit. We do $30 this year, $30 next year, $30 the year after. And in five years time, before you know it, you had $150 premium on your units. And if you take that on a cap rate basis, you've got 827 units at $150 more per unit. You're talking about roughly $1.5 million in extra net operating income that we can distribute to investors. 
So it takes our 8% cash on cash up to about a 14, 15% cash on cash in five years' time. But on top of that, on a cap rate basis, if you take our $1.5 million extra income and you divide it by 6%, current market rate is actually five and a quarter percent. But on a 6% cap rate, you're looking at a $25 million capital upside on this property. And we're putting down roughly $23 million as a deposit. So we're looking to double our money in five years if we can just increase rents $30 a year, $30 per month per year. So if I ask myself, what's the probability of that happening? I think it's reasonable that we can expect to double our money in five years. And then on the downside is if we don't get that at, uh, at all, we're still collecting 8 to 10% cash on cash returns, no matter what happens, even if we don't push the rent up. So for me, it's about risk mitigation. I want to know my income's real. I want to know I've got diversification of income across multiple tenants, multiple assets, multiple geographies. And then I want to know that uh, the probability of upside is there. But even if it doesn't happen, I'm still going to get my income. And what's a very important point here is we were, made, we were able to negotiate with our lender to take out certain covenants in their lending documents. One of the covenants is the debt service coverage ratio. So uh, to go a little bit um, deep into the sophistication level here is a debt service coverage ratio is simply the amount of income as a percentage on the debt to make sure that if your, your coverage ratio changes or goes down, um, they can then force you to put more capital in so that their exposure, risk exposure doesn't change in the assets. Now, what's extremely important about this clause is if you have a debt service coverage ratio over the the full five years or seven years is if a recession happens or a downside event happens like a 2008 and we have to discount our rent to keep our, our tenants. So let's say we have to discount by 10%, which by the way, was the worst performance on average in the US uh, in the last 50 years was a correction of 10% on the on the rental income. Um, if on, on normal uh, managed assets. So if we have to discount it by 20%, if the bank forces you via their debt service coverage ratio to put more capital in, you stand in a risk where there could be a capital call because the bank's changing their mind on how much risk they've got. We were able to get Morgan Stanley to take those uh, covenant ratio clauses out of the lending documents. So we've got a debt service coverage ratio going into the deal on the day we close, but then we've got no coverage ratio after that, which means we've got a cash flow buffer to protect ourselves in a recession where we can't lose the property and we don't have to put more money into the property if our income changes. So this is about risk mitigation more than anything else. We know our income's real. We know our income can go down a little bit in case a recession happens and it doesn't affect our, um, our ownership or our capital call position and it doesn't force us to sell and it doesn't force us to put more money in, which is very, very important. And then the next level up is what's my probability of upside. And I think the probability of upside is very, very high. I'll, if I'm putting in $1.1 million and I double my money, I'm very, very happy in five years to have a $2 million payday. So um, the term of the investment is five years. We've got debt terms, 75% uh, uh, loan to value on a 10-year fix, which means we've also managed to mitigate the downside risk on the debt. We don't have a gun against our head in five years time to sell the asset or refinance the asset or find money because we're under the gun. What we have is we have time on our side with very good debt terms. And just to give you guys perspective, because of the trade war that's going on in, in the States and China is people, you know, money is running to safe assets, uh, which has created um, the US treasury rate has run all the way down to about 1.7%. And because our debt is linked to the treasury rate on the day that we close, um, we're currently coming in at around 36 to 3.7% interest, which, you know, if you're buying at a 6.3% cap rate and you're getting interest uh, on an interest only mortgage at 36 to 3.7%, you can imagine the cash flow is very, very significant. And that's really the, the pitch, guys. So if you've got any questions, let me know. Awesome. Well, thank you, Brennan. As you, while you were talking, I've obviously gone onto the platform. I've also gone through your uh, brochure, which is quite frankly the longest brochure I've ever seen in my life. Um, <laughs> I, I, I kept going down and down and down and down. I couldn't believe it. But what I see you've done, obviously, is you've got all the projects plus all the details and everything. So <clears throat> for the uh, 
right brain people, you can read the first 10 pages, and for the left brain people, you can read all 180 pages. Um, <laughs> but the point being is that um, it is all there and all the documentation there. You can see in terms of the risk uh, categories, it's at a core plus for all the reasons that um, that uh, Brendan has, has explained. Sorry, let me just close this down quickly. Um, and um, you know, and uh, I, you know, I think that's pretty pretty critical. If anyone's got any questions, please uh, please just type them up there or put them up there. Um, obviously, we've got Brendan live. You know, we are actually doing a live launch with Brendan to our entire you know community uh, next Tuesday. So at 7 p.m. South African time next Tuesday. However, what we wanted to offer was to all the previous investors, all the LLC investors, was to effectively uh, you know offer the pre-launch. I know. There's, um, you know, there's not a huge amount of time on this deal. I think the closing date is the 27th of September, if I remember rightly, Brendan. Yeah, that's correct. So at the moment, we're aiming for the 27th of September. Um, we're looking pretty good to close by then. Uh, so we, we've we actually raised pretty much all the money. Um, a couple of investors might run into some timing issues. So we're it's a case of first come, first served at the moment. We've probably got, uh, let me just check my spreadsheet. Hold on for a second. Um, we've got about 1.1, 1.2 million dollars left um, to raise. So, so if anybody is interested, you really are fortunate right now to have a first look advantage before Wealth Migrate launches it to their whole platform. Um, and I would say, like, if you if you do have the money sitting available in the states or anywhere else in the world, um, there's there's a very strong reason why I love this type of stuff. And, and I'll just tell a personal uh, sort of quick story. Uh, is is I changed my investing perspective to pretty much only buying income producing assets over the last three or four years. And um, and what's happened is, is as it's played out over time is it's put me in a very, very strong financial position on a personal basis because I now never worry. I can travel the world with the income that I'm producing out of my, my real estate investments. And it doesn't actually matter if I do another deal or don't do another deal um, because of what I've been buying, which is exactly this stuff, which is producing income for me now without any problems. Um, and, and I've seen how it produces income consistently over time, as long as it's managed properly with good quality managers. And we really make sure that that is in place with a lot of incentive programs built in to keep the management uh, team honest and to keep them on point. Uh, and it's been very empowering to have a US dollar income stream that's phenomenal. Uh, to give my family the freedom to travel. I mean, I'm I'm in Canada here doing the the webinar with you guys because we're able to travel wherever that's, we want. That's, just, that's actually just because you live in America, but you're actually a refugee that can't stay there. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I got to do a visa <laughs> run. I know you well enough, and I know that everyone here knows you well enough that I'm allowed to say that. So. Yeah, <laughs> but from next year, I will be permanent in the states anyway. But you know, it's given me the freedom of choice to be able to do what I'm doing now without stress or pressure or, or you know, uh, panic decisions or anything like that. So if anybody's investing, I mean, I know why that why lots of people invest in diversified offshore portfolios, which is why Wealth Migrate exists. But I thought that was just like, it's my personal story on why I love these assets. I've had a, the benefit of, I mean, we if you look at our Infinity's track record, we built a $160 million portfolio in four years, and this will take it to 200 and 20 odd million, somewhere around there, 230 odd million in assets under management. Um, and it's it's been a hell of a journey, but um, at the same time, it's just because we we protect investors and we only buy income producing stuff that really works. Brendan, a couple of questions here quickly. I'm conscious, sorry, I'm, I'm going to yep. have to jump off um, in seven minutes. I've got a, um, a meeting with Hilda, but um, just quickly, so if I do need to leave, you know, I might have to leave anyway, and I can leave you and Lyndon to finish any questions. But Andrew's asked, um, uh, is this is this a hard five-year deal? Do you have to sell after five years, or can shareholders vote to extend? So there are two answers to that question. So um, no, it's not a hard five years. Uh, we we pretty much want to. Uh, have the opportunity to stay in for longer if we want to, which is why we took 10 year debt. We also got a better interest rate on 10 year debt. So that worked very much in our favor. So we want the optionality. If there's an option, the way infinity gets paid is we have a 6% preferred return to investors, anybody that puts physical cash in the deal, and then a 30% promote. So 70% goes to the investors, 30% goes to the sponsor group of which infinity gets uh, about half of that. 
and Alon, who's the who's providing his balance sheet for the debt and all the property management stuff, he gets 15% on the investor's money as his promote. So on that basis, um, we look to exit at around five years, six years, because that's actually when we get paid a reasonable amount of money. If we've doubled uh, investors' equity and we can get paid two, three, four million dollars on exit, we've got a very real incentive to do that. However, if it's producing great cash flow and we don't have to sell and it's just working, we'll judge that in uh, in five years' time. So it's not a hard you know, thing where we are going to sell definitely in five years. We're going to judge what the market is doing at that particular time and if it makes sense to sell at that time to exit and everybody makes money. Who's managing this project day to day and what is their track record? So Alon is managing it day to day. Well, besides the staff that are on site that have been employed there for the last seven or eight years uh, that by the previous owner. Um, so they will be our on-site team and there's about 45 staff members across the board that we're taking over. So they already know their assets. They know how to run them correctly. They're great management people already. And then Alon is taking over that management um, and he's already got a $250 million portfolio that he's running of about 4,000 units. He's got a phenomenal track record. Um, his delinquencies are excellent. His bad debts are excellent. His ability to take an asset that's already good and make it better is phenomenal. Um, I've seen the financials on the last uh, nine deals that he's done. So my due diligence on them was to validate what was he performing when he pitched a deal three or four years ago, and then what did he actually deliver? And every single deal, deal he out delivered what he said, what he put on the spreadsheet in the beginning. Um, so I'm very comfortable uh, deploying funds with him and having him manage the assets. But at the same time, um, we like keeping people honest. So we built in some protection mechanisms there uh, so that if we need to get rid of the management uh, because they're not performing, we can. Um, but we have to put them in alongside the existing manager because he's uh, under terms with the lender that he must be a co-manager at the minimum. So if we do replace him, he's, he effectively just has another management company alongside. But we're very comfortable to have him on as the manager with our protection clauses built in. Are cap rates compressing or releasing now? Well, what's phenomenal about the US market in general is cap rates are compressing, especially in multifamily and especially in B-class assets. Um, we, we did our market research on the Oklahoma market and we found cap rates in B and A class assets are between four and, a, and three quarters percent and five and uh, five and a quarter. So uh, in Tulsa and Oklahoma in B class assets are about five and a quarter percent and we're buying at a 6.3 percent. So in the current market rates, if we had to sell this at a five and a quarter, we'd make a $10 million profit tomorrow. We, we did take a... Um, the REIT doesn't want us to sell this asset within the first year because obviously if somebody bought it from them and sold it in six months and did a flip and they published their reports that said they sold it for X amount and somebody else sold it for more than that, obviously then they're going to be under pressure because um, they're going to be like, well, why didn't you guys just sell it for more money? So we undertook that we would not sell it in the first year, uh, but technically we've got a $10 million discount. And how do I know that that's real? is there are already backup offers in place right now north of $80 million. So if we don't close, the property sold the next day to someone else for more than we paid for it. One of the deals uh, you showed a few years ago, you told us that you checked every lease. Did you do this here? Yeah, checked every lease. We actually have a full team in the States that does uh, the due diligence. So I didn't personally read 827 leases. No, I've got to put that on the table. But what we do is we have a team of people. So we've got eight people that went to the property. They walked every single unit. They read every single lease. They did a full lease analysis. Uh, if anybody wants that, you can actually get the lease analysis from me, a full ledger analysis, and then a comparison of that lease analysis against the actual bank statements to make sure that the money is actually arriving in the account. And then what I do is I spot check. So I then go and check about 10% of them to make sure that whatever our analysis team is doing is telling me is actually the same thing that I'm picking up. Um, and the analysis team actually picked up more stuff than I picked up on the leases. So I'm very comfortable with them. And that was Alon's team that did it. Um, and the level of detail that they went into was exceptional. Most of the time when I'm getting a, a rent roll analysis from somebody, it's very, very basic and very light. 
I'm very happy with the level of detail that they went into. Um, and then I personally spot check about 10% of them. So yeah, I've read 80 leases. It wasn't any fun. How have your other Infinity deals performed? Uh, so our worst performing deal, uh, we exited before a capital call on a development project that was very, very high end $4 million condos in Sarasota. Um, where we actually sold our equity position in the project to one of the big investors there and we made an 8% markup on our, our membership interest. That was our worst performing deal. Um, and obviously when it's a development deal of high-end luxury apartments where you're relying on the sale of those apartments as part of the capital stack, it had inherent risk in it. I don't like development deals. We actually uh, didn't want to do that deal and it came up right around Christmas time and we said what we'll do is send out a text message to a few investors that were available at that time and we raised three million dollars in literally six days and everybody went crazy because the returns looked so phenomenal and we said look it's high risk stuff it's development for sale product anyway we sold that out we made eight percent our best performing deal to date is a 31 percent rr where we built 262 apartments in kingsport tennessee um we happened to be in a situation where the the project is in an opportunity zone. If anybody's been in the States or researched the States, um, opportunity zones came up as a tax incentive program through the Trump administration to boost real estate investments. And we couldn't get the benefit because we started the development before the opportunity zone allowance came through, but a buyer could get the benefit as long as they bought it before lease up had taken place. So we ended up in a fortunate position where, um, where we were able to exit the project very successfully uh, as if it was already fully leased up so we took all lease up risk off the table and we made a 31 percent internal rate of return um but we were very happy to keep that property and at the moment um just because i got a report last week i asked the guys that finished it out to send me a report just so that i can see what it looks like completely done and uh they're already at about 65 percent occupancy after six months of lease up which is phenomenal and um, so we would have been fine in terms of income over there which is why we, we built it then on uh, some of our other projects, uh, we've... Brendan, Brendan. Sorry, yep. mate, just a quick one. Um, I think this is very valuable. Um, and if uh, you and Lyndon can stay on and keep answering questions. Lyndon, I presume you can see the questions. Would you mind taking over from me? I do need to exit, though. I've got Hilda online on another a meeting I need, to, I need to go to with her. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone. You know, you've all got my details. You've all got, you know, Lynn, uh, Lyndon and Brendan's details. You've got any questions i'm very excited about what you're doing brendan as i said we've Thanks. been trying to get the multi-family you know literally since we got there in 2012 so the fact that you've got a strong partner on the ground with you know a couple of hundred million dollars of track record i think is is very exciting i'm very grateful that we're getting to share it with all our investors so thank you very much i don't want to close down the webinar for those that are asking questions i don't want to stop this but i do i do need to duck so what i suggest we do is i'm just going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to mute myself and the meeting can go on, but I'll, I'll then join Zoom and, um, and, and say good night to everyone. Perfect. Great. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate you being online with us tonight. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Brendan, Brendan, the next question was, um, who decides on the exit strategy? Uh, so that was the, the second part of my, my answer. Sorry, I forgot to actually bring that in. So the investment committee effectively decides um, and we do have a voting system where all investors can vote on an exit uh, in terms of a sale or a refinance or anything like that um, as long as uh, it's outside of the pro forma. So what does that mean? Is we've, we've built our pro forma that uh, in each year for the next five years, um, as long as we hit a certain number, we don't need a vote to sell. Um, and that number would produce a 16 to 17 percent internal rate of return to the investors as long as we beat that we can sell without a vote so that's at the management discretion if we're under that we need a vote and then it needs to be unanimous so if we're in a situation where we have to sell because the market's bad and we're selling for less than we uh than our projection um then the investors do have a say if we're better than our projection uh we don't have to vote um in terms of who would we sell to, uh, at the moment there is so much capital competing for product in the States that it's an open playing field. Um, like we've got uh, family offices, wealthy individuals, private equity houses, insurance companies, uh, public REITs and private REITs all trading 
the same quality product that we are trying to buy right now. Um, and it's it's like it's like going onto private property and looking at how many houses are for sale and how fast they trade. Um, if they priced correctly uh, in the states, is like that's the multifamily market. It, it traded 175 billion dollars last year. It's the biggest um, market sector by far across the world. Um, it's the most stable market sector across the world. Number two behind it is medical. Um, so in terms of stability and market liquidity and stuff, is uh, is it's very 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 liquid in the states. A lot of people and a lot of types of buyers buy these types of assets. And then the last one is if we hit a billion dollars, we're going to uh, reverse uh, REIT ourselves. So they, they call it up REIT. We'll basically convert it to a listed entity um, and look to exit in that fashion. And everybody benefits very well if we do that, which is basically a carbon copy of what the existing seller has already done. So they bought the assets out of exactly these assets. They then listed, they pulled out a whole lot of capital. They're now deploying that capital into A class product and they're slowly winding down their B-class products. We're going to just cut, copy, paste what big investors are already doing. Great, Brendan. Thanks. Um, what is the difference between Class A and Class B? So Class A is really the expensive stuff. And, and this is a very great question, I must say. Well done to have asked that. Because um, it, it, it's pertinent to the Oklahoma market and particularly the assets that we're buying. So uh, Class A is effectively... What what we're buying here is 30-year-old Class A. So we're buying mid-1980s Class A products. So Class A is what is the new stuff now um, where it's obviously got much higher-end finishes, usually smaller units, um, slightly more modern, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, on Class A product, what's extremely important is it's expensive to build. So for us to be able to replace our product right now, even as a Class B product, which is good quality, good neighborhoods, uh, but slightly older product. Class C, for example, would be more like Section 8 housing or uh, affordable housing, more workforce guys, guys that are earning two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 a month. Class B, our tenant profile is earning more like four dollars to $10,000 a month. They're stable, income-producing families. Um, so that, those are like the major differentials. What's extremely important here, though, is nobody can build Class B product in our markets that we're buying in uh, and make it make sense. So what, what tends to happen is when new developers come to the market and they go buy a piece of land and they want to build a multifamily development, they go build 300 class A products instead of class B product because they have to, based on the cost of building, be able to rent those units for between two and a half and three thousand dollars a month, which means it creates this disparity between class B and class A products. Our tenants can't afford to go from their 800 to a thousand dollars a month up into a two and a half thousand dollar a month apartment. So they've got their own niche of tenant profile that they aim at that we don't want. And what's extremely important here is the class A product is what takes a knock first in a recession. Because everybody that's renting two and a half thousand, if they lose their job or they downscale, they go and rent from us in B class product. They don't want to go to workforce terrible housing in class C product, but they're happy to go pay a thousand dollars a month for a nice apartment in a good neighborhood with a good school district. You know, so when people downgrade, they go to B class products. And then when people come out from, um, let's say, single family homes or something, they go into B class affordable products. So what tends to happen is we've got this huge inherent demand and we've got this big gap between a thousand dollars a month that we can charge and two and a half thousand dollars a month of what new product can charge, which means nobody can build competitive product, which means we always end up in an undersupplied and, and overdriven in terms of demand situation which then drives our rent growth and with our rent growth that drives our capital upside on our exit great question brilliant and then the last one for tonight is um a bit more information about your partner so what is elon's business name and his surname you can go look him up uh it's called ferndale realty partners or ferndale realty in boulder colorado uh his name is elon uh, yonatan so you're welcome to look him up. You, you probably won't take your calls, guys. Uh, we've got a great relationship with him. He's not going to you know, do deals with, with any investors outside of doing deals with us, simply because if you look at it from a sponsor's perspective, he doesn't want to work with 20, 30, 40 partners. He wants to work with one. He wants to say, I've got a great deal. I need $23 million. Make sure it happens on this date. 
and we do all the hard graft raising the money dealing with the investors uh, dealing with all the communications and the tax questions and all that stuff um, and then all he has to do is do what he's great at which is find and run great properties so uh, it's it's a, it's a great symbiotic relationship that really works but yeah go look him up Ferndale Realty in Boulder Colorado Great. Uh, my sense on this is um, that question was probably more about doing due diligence on the partners as part of their decision here rather than to try and find a <laughs> direct but, relationship. No, look, I, I mention it um, because a lot of investors that have the, the the financial ability tend to want to go work on their own. If they want to deploy five to ten million dollars and say, look, I want to just do a deal with you on my own. And what's interesting about Alon is you actually can't. The only reason we got the ability to do deals with him is because of our relationship with Greg and the family connection there and he force functioned it to be able to go and do deals with him otherwise we wouldn't have this opportunity so it's a it's a very real opportunity uh, but yeah I, I share it openly so that you can go check it out brilliant brendan thank you great having you on tonight i know we've got the official launch uh, next week um you know there's a part of me that's uh, that i know we've i think if i remember correct there's a two million gap on this particular deal that uh, that you reserve for the wealth my great clients yeah we can make space um so we've got about one million left to raise in terms of our minimum threshold what's nice though is uh is the way the morgan stanley debt has been arranged is if we raise more money we simply get slightly better terms so what will happen is we'll go from a three-year interest only period to a five-year interest only period instead if we put slightly more money in which is uh, and that amount is roughly one million dollars so that's why i know we can still actually push the, the envelope a little bit we can close with only a million dollars but if we put in two million dollars we're going to get better debt terms all right great there's a part of me that's hoping that by the time we do this uh, launch officially to our members next uh, next week that we might have um, some sad news for many of them who want to invest at that point so listen great uh, great having you on this week thank you very much looking forward to doing this again with you in a week's time uh, specifically yes. around georgia hill everyone who was on with us tonight uh, thank you it's uh, been great having you online a really good set of questions both on the initial part of the webinar around the llc's and the way forward as well as uh, to brendan on the steel um, please do reach out to me or scott uh, tomorrow if, or the next day if you have any questions around any, either of these two parts to the webinar uh, we really do want to prioritize uh, finding solutions and adding value to the investors. Uh, that's at the core, I think, of both uh, Wealth Migrates values and certainly uh, Brendan joining us tonight. I know he shares those from Infinity side. So, guys, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And hopefully you hear from many of you soon. Good night, everybody. Thank you for your time. And thank you, Lyndon, for the invitation. And I'm, I'm super excited. So look forward to seeing you guys on board. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Bye-bye.